Hello, my name is Johanna Latt and I'm a social responsibility solution expert at SAP. In today's unit, we'll talk about holistic and interconnected solutions and how SAP can help you get started on, on your human rights to diligence journey. So first of all, welcome to week three. Now that you know the topic of human rights to diligence in some more detail, let's talk about how to tackle it with the help of SAP. A holistic solution for human rights to diligence requires all lines of businesses or LOBs to be involved. We need oversight on corporate level covering the full value chain, meaning from own workforce to workers in the value chain, consumers and communities. To deal with step one in the human rights to diligence process, meaning the policies and risks, you often have legal and compliance in the lead on corporate level, working together with all other lines of businesses to assess and manage risks and set up policies. Step two are the actions that come out of the high level risk assessment and then are documented on corporate level, but handled by the LOBs in practice. You have human resources and operations for your own workforce, procurement and supply chain for workers in the value chain, and often operations and marketing for consumers and communities. Depending on your specific industry and company, additional or different LOBs may be involved, but this is a typical view. Then eventually for step three, we need to bring it back on corporate level. We have to do reporting and impact assessment. This is often handled by the board or specific sustainability teams. Once again, this will happen in collaboration with the lines of businesses that are actually taking the actions. So this is the ideal flow. But in practice, there are currently still a number of challenges, especially when looking at this from a corporate perspective. So let's have a look at them. Challenge number one is about the corporate level risk assessment. Many companies struggle with the identification, assessment and management of the risks to people as opposed to the financial risk to the business. This connects back to the topic of double materiality assessment that many regulations require, which often asks for exactly that, the risk to people and also the environment. But how can a business do this in practice and across the full value chain? How can a risk to people be quantified and how can IT help with that? The second challenge is about the tracking of actions to prevent, mitigate or remediate human rights violations across the value chain. Actions will come out of the risk assessment on corporate level, but will be carried out and further defined by the LOBs. The challenge is that these actions need to be tracked across the full value chain and reported back on corporate risk level. Furthermore, the actions need to be auditable and businesses want insights into each action's progress. And last but not least, as you've learned before, elaborate stakeholder collaboration with internal but also external stakeholders is essential something that businesses often struggle with and need IT to support. The third challenge connects back to the actions from challenge two, but focus on the effectiveness and impact of each action. In order to do a comprehensive reporting on corporate level, the outcome of each action needs to be measured. So, did the action reach what it was supposed to reach? Did it do what it was supposed to do? What was the impact of this action on the problem that I was trying to fix? Did we mitigate negative impact on people or maybe even create positive impact? Only by measuring the actions taken, a business will be able to improve on future actions, better understand the risks and efforts needed and ultimately create true positive impact. The fourth challenge is line of business specific. It is about the very prominent challenge many businesses have in gaining visibility into information relevant for human rights risk assessment from end-tier suppliers. New regulation requires businesses to look beyond their direct suppliers, also known as tier one suppliers. This is really hard to do since businesses often do not have access to their indirect suppliers beyond tier one. And it becomes incrementally harder the further we go down the value chain of a business. This is a tough challenge for all businesses since in order to identify risks in their supply chain, they would need information such as country of operation, industry, policies, audits, certificates, and of course, violations of their entire suppliers. So to summarize, we see four big open challenges in human rights due diligence that IT will need to enable and support. Three of them on corporate level and one on supply chain level. The three challenges on corporate level actually form an iterative process of identifying, assessing and managing risks to people, 
then the risks inform actions that need to be tracked. And then they need to be measured for effectiveness and impact and then fed back into the risk management and assessment. This should be an ongoing process and happen across the full value chain. Specifically on supply chain level, gaining visit visibility into information relevant for human rights risk assessment, especially from entire suppliers, is a big challenge. Once that information is obtained, it would feed into the corporate level risk assessment and inform actions. SAP's vision is to provide software solutions for all of these challenges, and we're actively working on our solution proposals. While we're working on these, there is a lot that SAP solutions can already do for you right now. For legal and compliance on corporate level, you can leverage SAP's existing offerings for risk management as part of our governance, risk and compliance solution portfolio. For your own workforce, SAP offers SAP success factors, along with SAP s for hana for EHS, workplace safety. For workers in the supply chain, there is SAP Reba and the SAP Business Network. And lastly, for consumers and communities, we have SAP s for hana for product compliance and SAP s for hana for EHS environment management. SAP Sustainability Control Tower can help you bring your insights back to the board and into the sustainability teams. So let's look at these core solutions along with some additional products in some more detail. As mentioned, we have two solutions currently helping you manage human rights to diligence on corporate level. We have SAP governance, risk and compliance solutions that can help manage your policies and your financial risks on corporate level. SAP Sustainability Control Tower helps you to unlock the power of your ESG data to record, report and act on it at scale and across your company. Here you can gather insights from all your different lines of businesses, measure your progress, and act on your social and people goals across your whole organization. Beyond that, we have a number of solutions supporting the different lines of businesses. Taking the structure from the CSRD regulation, we would look at the own workforce first, where we need to ensure safe working conditions, equal treatment and opportunity, and other work-related human rights. SAP s for hana for EHS workplace safety can help ensure safe and secure working conditions for your own operations. SAP Success Factors helps you create and maintain a diverse, equitable and inclusive workforce. And with SAP Field Glass, you can track your external workforce such as contractors and ensure compliance with local labor laws. Next, we need to look at the workers in the value chain and ensure that they have the same rights as our own workforce. SAP Business Network, together with SAP Ariba Supply Risk Management, can help you with monitoring your supply chain, allowing for supplier self-assessment, credential and certificate checks, as well as ensuring the adoption of policies and monitoring the ESG risks of each of your suppliers. The third pillar are communities and having to ensure economic, social, cultural, civil and political rights, as well as specific focus on indigenous people. SAP s for hana for EHS Environment Management can support here by monitoring and reducing your company's environmental impact, for example, caused by waste. Furthermore, SAP s for hana for Product Compliance helps promote safe and responsibly made products and services according to local laws and various certifications. Depending on the industry, SAP s for hana for Product Compliance is not only in support of the communities, but also in support of the end consumers whose personal safety needs to be ensured. Again, depending on the industry, the SAP customer data platform can furthermore help to promote and protect data privacy, another pillar of the consumer chapter in the CSRD regulation. In the following units, you will hear deep dives into many of the listed solutions to help you gain a better understanding how they support your business today already and how you can kick off your human rights due diligence journey. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Sandro Luvisa. I'm in GSC Engineering, concentrating on risk management, especially in the context of environmental and social governance. In today's brief session, I would like to introduce you sub-financial compliance management with its integrated risk management capabilities and how they can help you in order to satisfy your ESG requirements.
In the previous sessions, you already have learned that ESG requires you to be active in various areas. So it has a strong governance aspect towards it. It has an aspect where you need to define your sustainability strategy. It has the aspect that you need to define concrete metrics and targets in the context of ESG. And as mentioned newly, you also need to report your ESG relevant risks. SAP provides you for all of these required uh, activities software which helps you to automize, which helps you to facilitate your life in capturing all this data. Here I would like to give you just a brief overview on what SAP provides you. So on the lowest level you, you find a layer called capture data. Here we have products like SAP Environment Health and Safety which helps you to capture carbon data or you have products like Success Factor which helps you to document personal data. You have FCN which um, helps you also to define policies. So here this is planned for, for, for release this year and on the layer above of that you want to structure and analyze all the data that, that you captured. And for that, we, we have a sustainability control tower as a, as a key product. Um, we have SAP Analytics Cloud as a more generic analytics product and the so-called um, SAP Financial Compliance Management with its risk management capabilities. On the highest level or at the end of the process, if you will, you need to report and disclose this data. For that, SAP offers you some disclosure management. Now, when we talk about risk management, we talk usually about the process and uh, the rough process steps you see as indicated on the slide. Uh, and, and as a first step, you have a risk identification process where you uh, build up a risk catalog, then you have a risk mitigation step where you define activities in order to mitigate the potential risks that you identified and then um, you may also have the issue and remediation process step in the, the sense that um, if mitigation actions may fail, you would like to um, remediate the discovered issues. And then, of course, last but not least, you have a reporting um, requirement uh, where you would like to um, document and also report um, the risk status. In in, in, in order to make it a little bit more tangible, um, we added some, some, some examples. Um, here, let's assume that we would like to reach 30% of women in leadership positions. So this is our, our goal. This is defined somewhere in a metric. And the corresponding risk, uh, of course, could be that we do not reach 30%. So you could define this in in a risk management tool exactly like, like this. So threshold of 30% uh, may not be reached or you could keep it a little bit more, more general, the, like, like here, the, the risk of lack of inclusion. The next step that you want to pursue is that you, you need to define controls in order to keep track of exactly this risk. So here you, you could define as a control the, the simple question, how many women uh, are in your staff? And then, of course, uh, the subsequent step is that you need to, to count them. And uh, here FCM provides you also, uh, let's say, two options. One is what we call a manual procedure, um, so where you can send 
a task to a person which then manually goes into your HR system and uh, accounts how many uh, female staff you have or you could define an automated procedure which is connected to your S4 system or to an HR system and then automatically um, runs this analysis. And now let's assume that uh, you do not reach 30% or the current status is 15% or 20%, then of course you would like to have an alert on it so that you can react on that. And here FCM also helps you in order to um, define and to create automatically um, an issue which then has a remediation capabilities as subsequent steps included. So what I wanted to explain here is that um, risk management um, is not only the, let's say, pure definition of the risks and the reporting on it uh, as required by uh, CSRD. Um, it involves way more. It involves an entire process and only if you operationalize this process, then of course you um, can be uh, secure that uh, the risks are addressed properly and not only just reported on. Now I would like to um, show you on a different example um, how this looks within FCM. So what you see here is our risk registry. So it's our risk uh, catalog, if you will. You see here the definition of a risk. And in this case, we, we use an example of the uh, environmental context. Um, so the risk of suppliers operating in high water stress region which may have an, an impact on, on your production um, if uh, you, you uh, encounter um, water supply issues. And you see that in the software you can name it, you, you can give description, you can uh, also uh, narrow it down to specific org units, maybe a, a part of the business which operates in high water stress regions. Um, you can of course give it a categorization, um, a risk category. In this example we just use the generic ESG compliance as a, as a category. Nevertheless, what is also very uh, important is that you can give it um, a financial impact. So you can define an inherent risk level um, which a with a financial impact. What we see on the subsequent uh, screen is that you define these, as mentioned earlier, treatments. So a treatment for, for this risk could be the reduction of suppliers in high water stress regions. And you can give it a, a probability, uh, a, an impact, how, how much this will reduce your inherent risk and then consequently come to a lower residual risk. So the, the, the software helps you in order to document this. It helps you also in order to operate this. What do I mean with it helps you to operate this? Um, remember, we said you mitigate risks with potential controls. So here in, in this context, within the software, you define a control, which in this case you can name it the same way, uh, reduction of high risk sourcing regions. And you map this control also to the risks so that you always have this pairing risk and control. Also with the control, you, you, you have same capabilities that you could narrow it down to, to specific uh, regions or parts of, of, of your, your, your enterprise, lines of business, 
uh, or even business processes if you want to be more specific. Attached to the control, of course, then is the definition of concrete tasks. So what needs to be done in order to fulfill this control. And here um, we have uh, defined an automated control, uh, which uh, says, uh, show me material source from high water stress regions. So the expected result in this context is that the system automatically um, checks in your um, ERP uh, purchasing uh, system um, if you have suppliers for, and for which materials um, in high water stress regions. And in our example here, we, we have uh, connected FCM with this procedure to an S4 system and run this control and procedure automatically on a regular base. And you see here the result of it, um, that the system shows you all the, the, the purchase orders with suppliers in high water stress regions. If you define this as um, a failure of, of the procedure or an, an, an aspect you want to react on it, then you can customize that um, this list will create automatic an issue list. So that in order to mitigate this risk, you could evaluate if you may want to, to switch supplier or if you may want to distribute a little bit the purchase order quantities over suppliers in not as risky regions. So as, um, as mentioned earlier, this is only a brief introduction on how uh, FCM risk management can help you to uh, mitigate your ESG risks. And uh, I hope that it gave you a rough idea um, how software can help you and how software can operationalize uh, the risk management process, especially in the context of ESG. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, and uh, welcome to uh, week three, uh, unit three uh, of the Open SAP course on uh, social responsibility. Uh, my name is Mike Censorato. I'm the global solution manager for uh, the SAP EHS uh, portfolio that we have here at SAP. Um, and this session or this unit is going to focus on uh, workplace safety and occupational health, uh, you know, what companies do uh, to kind of keep their workers safe, uh, how to drive worker wellness, things like that. Uh, again, in this unit, um, some key points that we're going to learn about. Um, to understand the challenges companies face, uh, trying to reduce incidents and ensuring a safe workplace. Um, talk about the kind of the context behind workplace safety, whether it's regulatory frameworks, uh, reporting frameworks, standards, things like that, um, and how companies can take an integrated approach uh, where you know, data and processes for HR, asset management, things like that are also incorporated into the overall uh, safety program. And then finally, we'll take a look at the, the functionality offered by SAP uh, on this topic um, and how it helps to identify hazards, you know, manage incidents and so forth. Okay. So first, um, let's talk about kind of the challenges companies face. Uh, and this is definitely, a, you know, it's a multidisciplinary topic and there's challenges in a lot of different directions. Um, the first thing, obviously, compliance. Um, you know, there's an evolving set of regulations, evolving set of, you know, it could be frameworks, company policy, uh, even, you know, any stakeholder expectations, uh, all that's changing over time. And that ends up being a challenge uh, for EHS practitioners and plant managers and, and corporate safety uh, individuals to kind of, you know, manage over time. Um, 
Increased cost of incidents, so when an incident does occur, the impact can be rather severe in different ways. Uh, but one thing for sure is that over time, um, whether it's workers' comp, uh, repair costs, cleanup, things like that, all that you know, cost has increased. Um, communication gaps between departments, and along with that, kind of a disjointed data flow. Um, you know, if, if HR is not talking with EHS, that impacts the efficiency and let's say the the effectiveness of a safety program uh, and how you know employees may understand what they need to do uh, as part of that uh, lack of awareness uh, maybe at the shop floor uh, all the way up to corporate you know what is happening across the enterprise what is happening in each facility what is happening on the shop floor that that impacts safety performance and ultimately um, let's say sustainability performance uh, evolving hazards, um, whether it's, you know, if you think about recent history with COVID, uh, automated manufacturing, things like that, where the, the, the type of work changes, the workplace environment changes, um, and all that leads to, you know, again, a kind of an evolving set of hazards overall that need to be dealt with. And along with that, an evolving workforce, um, whether it's Kind of the you know the the average age of a given workforce for a given company is is changing over time. Um, employee expectations, organizational culture, all of that's changing over time. That that can all impact uh, the effectiveness of of let's say a safety program and 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 how hard it ends up being for a company to ins again ensure a safe workplace uh, for the for the employees. Uh, those challenges lead to you know certain business needs. Um, again, you know, regulatory compliance is a, is a baseline, uh, driving safe operations, um, data privacy and protection when it comes to worker wellness and health information, uh, things like that. Um, the need to you know, continue striving for operational excellence uh, in different ways, training, um, uh, you know, situational awareness, uh, making sure that the the you know the appropriate stakeholders, whether it's EHS practitioners or plant managers and others, they really understand what's happening, you know, with the employees uh, on the shop floor, um, and and taking the appropriate measures to you know fix things when needed. Um, stronger safety culture. Uh, try to you know try to get employees to buy into safety programs, wellness programs, uh, making sure they're doing their trainings, things like that. Um, and then a couple of system items, uh, you know, analytics to, to, to track leading indicators uh, from a performance standpoint, um, system access that is, you know, uh, that meets the needs of, of the users that are going into the system. It could be, you know, all employees um, and then faster response times as well, making sure that when there are issues, there are hazards and incidents that, the system along with the organization are reacting uh, quickly enough to, to deal with it, okay? And all of that then leads to the need or kind of the, the creation of, of uh, you know, workplace safety programs. And here you see components of that. Uh, it's, I was, again, the, you start with the, the regulations and the frameworks that, that kind of put context around this and, and guide uh, the scope of this overall. Um, the focus on business process and making sure that uh, whether it's the life cycle of an incident or how a risk is being handled or communication with HR, um, all those things uh, are driven. Uh, proactive safety culture, again, making sure that employees buy in and that they're, they're doing their job in a way where safety is top of mind uh, and that they're, you know, when they when they see something, they say something. Um, they have the tools to do it. Uh, analysis, so um, all that data being generated over time, all that insight and information, making sure that the the right views are in place, the right analysis is being done uh, to to then, you know, uh, I guess generate the right ideas and and a path forward to for further improvement. Uh, empowered people. Uh, again, this is where at the shop floor, floor level, all the way up to corporate, making sure that all stakeholders, all employees have the information they need to do their job. They have the tools to do their job, the training, 
um, and that they can drive change when necessary. And then finally, platform. So with all that, all the, the processes in place, the culture in place, all those things, you want a platform to help enable that and maintain it going forward. Okay. Now, that is more of a traditional operational, let's say, view of workplace safety and what needs to be done uh, to ensure a safe workplace. Um, there is a clear relevance uh, to sustainability, and, and it's what we're talking about in this in this course around social responsibility. And uh, with that, uh, you know, along with the metrics that track environmental impact, such as carbon emissions and waste and things like that, um, we also have um, you know, a fair amount of items uh, focus on the social aspects and, and certain metrics around workplace safety. And there's different frameworks that drive some of this. The, one good example are the, uh, the UN uh, Sustainability Development Goals. Uh, and you see here some of the ones related to, let's say, people and wellness and equality, uh, the social aspects uh, specific to workplace safety. Uh, probably goal number eight would be the, the most relevant. But all these kind of kind of work together uh, from a workforce standpoint and, and a people standpoint. Uh, and so this is, again, one example where the, the safety data comes into play from a sustainability uh, perspective. Another example are the um, or is the, the GRI uh, Global Reporting Initiative um, reporting framework. And you see here um, a subset of the metrics overall, I think there's over 100 metrics total, uh, but there's definitely a set related to social and, and workforce topics. Um, 403 is the most specific to safety, where you get into incident rates and incident numbers and hazards, uh, but all these kind of work together um, as far as, as, as part of that kind of social aspect uh, to sustainability. And then another example, a newer one, um, CSRD, uh, and at the very bottom of that table, you see the um, you know S one seventeen. That's probably most related to the safety aspect of uh, you know tracking incidents, tracking complaints, making sure. Uh, also S one fourteen, the health and safety indicators, um, training and skills. All those are part of a safety program. Okay. All right. Uh, here is the you know. So with all that being said, so we talked about. The, the challenges in the business need. We've talked about the frameworks, uh, the components of a safety program. One of those was platform. And so here you see the um, uh, kind of the, let's say the, 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 the health and, uh, the EHS portfolio for SAP uh, broken into two products. Um, one is focused on environment management, whether it's waste and emissions. The other is um, around workplace safety, and you see the, the underlying processes there, or, you know, one focus on incident management and, and tracking safety hazards, um, chemical approval, chemical management, and all that flows towards our risk assessment engine, uh, where you know, identify risk, evaluate it, set the controls uh, in place to, to mitigate risk, and then some subset uh, pieces to that, um, uh, industrial hygiene and sampling, so there's more of a quantitative view of exposure risk. And then that all can feed to occupational health, which is where for a given set of employees, um, uh, we can drive protocols for various medical services, you know, tests and treatments related to uh, a certain exposure or a certain injury, things like that to make sure they're okay. Uh, maybe, you know, they, they can effectively get back to work. Um, and then finally, management of change. Uh, the idea there is to uh, track all you know changes that occur in the workplace, whether it's equipment changes, procedure changes, training. All those things can lead to additional risk, uh, and so we want to manage that effectively. Uh, those processes are under are, are underpinned by a compliance engine uh, and also a task management engine, uh, and all of that lives within S4 HANA uh, Digital Core, uh, integrated with uh, HR processes and asset management. And the final comment. All that data that's tracked and generated is then can flow to a set of analytics tools, real-time analytics tools, either some that are embedded within uh, EHS, uh, others that are um, uh, part of uh, you know, sustainability and SAC and so forth. Okay, so 
Now, if we kind of revisit those components of a safety program, we can then think about, you know, how, how does the software drive that? How, how applications drive that? And so we can link these and kind of showcase that here. Um, so from a regulation standpoint, obviously you would track uh, your compliance requirements, your compliance scenarios, any violations and, and exceedances that occur. Um, you track all the tasks related to those compliance requirements, um, do the necessary reporting, uh, things like that. From a process standpoint, you see there, um, you know, some of the ones that the SAP EHS, I kind of went through these already, but uh, uh, the ones that are key to the workplace safety program, uh, proactive safety culture, there we try to leverage the integration between EHS and HR and, and all again underpinned by an enterprise system um, where the EHS data, uh, again, whether it's incident management or things like that, it's, it's working closely with uh, what's being tracked in HR around performance uh, and certifications and trainings. Um, so we wanna make sure that's in place. Analysis, I see an example of a safety dashboard uh, the idea is we want to provide tools all the way down at the shop floor level, the plant level, the corporate level to make sure that, again, insight is available uh, and, and actionable, you know, information is, is there to, uh, to move forward. Um, empowered people, kind of a similar thing where, again, HR and EHS need to collaborate, uh, but the idea is that, um, you're now enabling this through, uh, you know, other mechanisms, whether it's IOT wearables, uh, other tools uh, on the shop floor and then platform that would be the SAP HS platform, uh, within S4 HANA. Okay. Um, again, just, uh, here you get just to show a couple screenshots of what the application looks like. Um, and there's a lot of you know, further detail on this, uh, that's available publicly. Uh, but the overall objective for workplace safety is to you know, proactively reduce risk, reduce incidents, uh, manage operational change, uh, and do that in an integrated fashion um, you know, at the process level, at the plant level. And some of the screenshots here, one is around uh, risk assessment. You see a risk matrix there, and the other screenshot is an example of some of the real-time analytics available to you know, individual users um, as, it, you know, as data is being uh, collected. All right, as far as looking ahead, a um, couple things, you know, a few things here that should be highlighted, whether it's, um, you know, overall, this topic's going to grow in importance um, as sustainability reporting evolves. Uh, optimization of the workforce is also going to be, I think, a topic that companies look at a little more closely as they try to, you know, further improve their performance uh uh, whether on the you know, productivity side, but also on the sustainability side, um, IoT, um, that market is growing. There's and again new options, new solutions all the time uh, to kind of monitor what's happening in the in the workspace and monitor uh, workers in general. And make sure that whether it's location, uh, fatigue, you know, exposure, all those things, and then really what may drive it the most is the fact that as as younger people enter the workforce, they are uh, more accepting of you know devices and and tracking, and that you know that uh, that should should lead to further adoption. Uh, predictive analytics and AI, and just that's you know that's a given. Uh, there will be you know better ways and better tools and algorithms to you know take all the information being generated and and create the right insight uh, that then turns into the you know the right action. Um, and finally, collaboration. Uh, I think that to really drive more sustainable operations overall, companies, you know, they've already figured out a lot. They've already gotten a lot better with reducing incident rates, things like that. But to learn more, to, to find better ways to do things, the, the, one of the best ways may be to collaborate with other companies uh, and, and, and company peers um, to, again, you know, figure out what's been done there, look at lessons learned, uh, move forward together. Okay, uh, key, key takeaways. So again, you know, challenges here are, are many uh, when it comes to uh, ensuring a safe workplace uh, across all facilities, all operations. Um, so companies, have, you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of business need there. 
uh, to, to, to address. Um, the KPIs that your know, companies track, let's say for traditional, you know, let's say safety reporting, uh, you know, whether it's incident rate or the number of incidents or the severity of hazards, uh, the number of medical appointments, you know, whatever it is, um, those all are directly re relevant to sustainability reporting, as we talked about with some of the, the frameworks and the metrics. Um, so, you know, that's actually uh, you know, kind of a positive drive uh, driver for, you know, getting companies to, you know, take all this information that is available to them anyway and making sure that then from a social aspect, uh, it's available to stakeholders uh, for, for their, you know, their purposes. And then finally, um, workplace safety as a, as a product so within SAP EHS, uh, the, the overall objective there is to identify hazards, mitigate risk, uh, and manage incidents and, and leverage the integration that we, we have inherently with our, you know, whether it's asset management, finance, HR, uh, things like that. Okay. Uh, here you just see some links to uh, various uh, tools uh, and, and you know, sources of information, whether it's the community forum, this is all public, uh, the sap.com pages, the Roadmap Explorer, things like that. Please check those out. There's also a, a short ebook available that we were able to publish last year. Um, and you know, that has kind of a, a basic L1 overview of, of SAP EHS functionality. Uh, so you know, I, I encourage you to, to take a look at all of that and uh, with that, I want to thank you for uh, spending time uh, on this topic around workplace safety and, and good luck in your uh, further learnings. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Leslie. I work in product marketing for SAP SuccessFactor Solutions. Welcome to our unit today on creating a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace. Now let's get started. All right, so what is the connection between diversity, equity, and inclusion, sometimes referred to as DE&I, and human rights? Well, let's start with this. Human rights cannot be separated. They're interconnected and they rely on each other. They can only be fully achieved when we embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion as core principles of how we operate. By valuing the worth and dignity of every person, regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religion, or any other trait, can we establish a society where we protect and respect human rights for all. So now let's look at diversity, equity, and inclusion and why it's an ethical and a business imperative. Let's start first of all with compliance. So compliance is often the first lens that organizations use when they start to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's a lot of legislation out there around uh, protecting workers from unsafe working conditions, uh, unfair labor practices, as well as discrimination. By maintaining ethical standards and creating a diverse and equitable workplace, companies can reduce the likelihood of legal disputes, of negative media coverage, uh, and reputational damage that can result from unethical behavior. I'm sure we've all seen some things out there in the media from companies doing just that. Now let's talk about some of the other stakeholders and why it's important for them. Let's start with the shareholders. So shareholders place a value on companies behaving ethically and protecting human rights uh, because it can reduce the legal, rep legal and reputational risks, um, leading to more financial stability and profitability. Ethical behavior can also enhance an organization's reputation um, and help increase shareholder value. Next, let's talk about employees. So employees are more, li more likely to feel valued and committed to a company that upholds the same set of standards and beliefs that they do. And if they feel that way, they're more likely to be more engaged and more productive. And that in turn leads to the ability to attract better talent and retain talent. Last stakeholder I wanna talk about is customers. So customers value 
companies that behave ethically and responsibility, uh, responsibly, excuse me, because it builds trust and loyalty. Customers want to buy things from organizations that they trust and they feel like they have the same standards as they do. And last but not least, diversity, equity, and inclusion is important because it actually results in business impacts. So there's numerous studies out there from organizations such as Deloitte, McKinsey, the Boston Consulting Group, that found that companies with more diverse workforces actually have better business results, including more innovation, uh, increased profitability, um, and things like that. When you bring together an organization of diverse individuals, you're gonna get more diverse thought and you're gonna get more innovation leading to better business results. So not only is diversity, equity, and inclusion an ethical imperative, but it's also a business imperative. So what should organizations do to foster a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion? First of all, it starts with understanding the makeup of your organization. How many people do you have in your organization? Who is being hired? Who's being terminated? who's being promoted, who's being developed, and who's not. So being able to know how this is, what's happening in your organization will allow you to understand where you may have some issues and may need to take some actions. So it starts with understanding your organization. It also involves providing equitable opportunities to employees. For example, through training and mentoring, making sure that regardless of where they work, that they have access to opportunities and they can further develop themselves to grow both within your organization and potentially outside your organization. Connecting employees to the information and people that they need to do their work. So especially when you're starting a new job, there's a lot of anxiety around who am I going to work with? What am I working on? And providing that information up front and throughout the onboarding process can really help solidify that relationship with the employee and help get them on board and engaged and productive faster. Along those lines, enabling psychological safety is very important, allowing people to bring their whole selves to work. What this does is it allows people to share their own ideas and it's well known that the more ideas and the more diversity of thought, the better innovation you can have. Because if everybody is thinking the same, you're always gonna do things the same way. And lastly, you need to give managers the tools and guidance they need to help them make better decisions and reduce unconscious bias. All right. So now let's go into specifically how SAP Success Factor solutions can support you in this endeavor. First of all, with SAP Success Factor solutions, um, you can get the reporting and insights you need to understand the makeup of your workforce, like we just talked about. Who's being hired, who's being promoted, um, who's being terminated, etc. And you can slice and dice that data by different characteristics, such as gender, um, level in the organization, etc. That can help you pinpoint where you may have some issues. And then once you put in um, initiatives to alleviate those, it can also help you measure and track and then improve on those. The next area I wanna talk about is giving your employees equitable opportunities. So both your business and your people thrive when you put opportunity at the center of your workforce strategy. So with SAP Success Factors, you can give your employees access to opportunities um, that are meaningful and relevant to them. So this includes learning opportunities, roles, exciting assignments, dynamic teams, mentor programs, peer connections, and more, all centralized for your employees to explore. Embedded intelligence takes um, important factors into consideration, such as interests, aspirations, and learning preferences of your employees. The result is a personalized experience that guides each employee of the direction they choose, helping to ensure that each employee has equal access to opportunity and growth. 
Next, I want to talk about connections and providing the information and access to people. So as I talked about earlier, starting a new job can be very stressful. Um, by providing access to the information that an employee needs when before, even before they start on day one, that can help ease that anxiety, help get them up to speed more quickly, and therefore be more productive. Also, it's very important to provide access to the people or information about the people they'll be working with. So with success factors, you have access to a clear organization chart so you can see who's who in the organization um, and that can help you navigate, especially in a complex organization. Next, um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that with SAP Success Factor Solutions, we enable employees um, to identify, self identify who they are. So we allow them to collect, we collect, excuse me, critical diversity data um, that can impact reporting and measurements, um, again, that we talked about earlier. So employees can indicate their chosen name, their personal pronouns, um, and gender identity within the people profile. And this information is displayed consistently across SAP Success Factors solutions. We also offer a name pronunciation feature. So this is helpful for employees um, that may have a name that is not as common or it may be you're um, in a different culture, it's pronounced a different way. So this allows the employee to record how their name should be pronounced so that um, people can address them properly and the way they prefer. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned earlier, needing to provide managers with the tools and the guidance that can help them eliminate potential bias. Some examples of how we do this in SAP Success Factor solutions are shown here. First off are bias alerts. So these are alerts that can prompt a manager when they're performing calibration or making compensation decisions of potential bias. What this does is that gives the, the manager the time to stop and think before making that decision and have an, a better look at the decision they're about to make. The second example shown here is functionality within our recruiting solution that leverages generative AI to enhance job descriptions, to make them both more relevant and specific to the job that needs to be performed, as well as more inclusive to attract a wider audience. So let's summarize some of the key takeaways from this unit. First of all, human rights and diversity, equity, and inclusion are tightly interconnected. Second, there's a lot of pressure on organizations to create a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace. And there's business benefits too. And last but not least, SAP Success Factor Solutions help to mitigate bias and create a culture of inclusion. Thank you. Hi and welcome to session five, product compliance as an essential element for human rights. My name is Sebastian Griesmeier and I'm happy to be here to give you three key aspects in regard to this topic. First of all, I would like to explain you how product compliance and human rights due diligence correlate. Secondly, I would like to explain you how an approach could look like in five steps. And third, and last but not least, I would like to explain you how SAP could support you with fulfilling with these obligations with software. To start, I would like to show you a map. As you already learned, there are several due diligence acts worldwide already in force or coming into force pretty soon. I would like to pick the German LKSG as one example to explain you the correlation in between of product compliance and due diligence. As you can see, there are seven pillars on the left side of the slide. These four of them are focusing on human rights. Three of them are focusing on environmental risks and two of these three especially focus on material compliance. 
as one of them, for example, which is directly linked to product compliance, is the Minamata Convention, which is focusing on mercury on a product level. And the other one, which is directly linked to product compliance, is the Stockholm Convention, which is focusing on POPs, or as we also say, persistent organic pollutants. So two of the seven pillars are directly linked with product compliance, and for sure the other ones are indirectly linked with product compliance as well. So that's the correlation in between of product compliance and human rights. To continue, I would like to show you a five-step approach, an exemplary one, how you could, could solve your obligations. There are five steps, starting with the organizational implementation, continuing with the supplier compliance, then you're focusing on the product compliance of purchased parts or purchased components. Afterwards, you continue with the focus on the self-manufactured products, the products your company is manufacturing. And last but not least, you're continuing with the compliance of your customers. As we are focusing today, as I already mentioned, and I'm a product manager for a solution, which is here to help you out with product compliance, for sure, today we are focusing on these two pillars or do these two steps, the product compliance of the purchase parts and the product compliance of the self-manufactured parts. So I hope now I could already answer you my second key aspect about how our approach could look like. To continue, I would like to show you how a software solution could, su could support you with fulfilling these obligations. Um, the SAP as for HANA for product compliance, first of all, supports you with managing obligations of several due diligence acts, not only one, but several ones like LKSG or, for example, Great Britain Modern Slavery Act. How we do that is with a so-called feature package, which has the name Compliance Requirement Management. Secondly, the software helps you with a feature package called Compliance Disclosure Management. And this feature package helps you to collect and consolidate ESG disclosures of suppliers and customers. To continue, there's also a third benefit, cause you can determine a product risk along the product structure and by doing so, it supports a risk-based approach. To continue is also what is worth to mention is that it's implemented into cross-departmental ESG actions which is realized with existing integrations, for example, into purchasing or into sales. And last but not least, by doing so and using the software, you will have a unique single source of truth for your product compliance information. So that's the overview of how a software solution could support you. And now I would like to go into detail about one of the core key packages there is the compliance requirement management, as already explained. And now we are focusing on the other, on the second really important feature package, which is called compliance disclosure management. This compliance disclosure management is focusing on, let's say, four aspects. First of all, it's there to process compliance disclosures, but not only that, it's also there to analyze compliance disclosures. And for sure, it helps you to determine a compliance status on product level. And it's designed in a way so that in future, it will also be able to support you with other ESG topics, such as PFAS or product certification matters, which are good examples for that. To continue and to go into detail, what does it mean to process compliance disclosures? Actually, it helps you to streamline the collection and the consolidation of in incoming compliance information. That's one of the key benefits. The other one is that it helps you to analyze on compliance disclosures, 
which means you get transparency on the target status on the one hand and the actual status on the other hand and by doing so you can identify risks. And to continue, you can define a compliant status of due diligence acts on a product level which means you can speed up the processing of compliance information along the product structure. And as already mentioned, by doing so, then you can determine the product compliance status on product level. With this slide, I would like to end my session. A software solution like SAP S4HANA for product compliance helps you with three topics. On the one hand, it enables the revenue growth, for example, by meeting top-line target with sustainability and compliance integrated into core business processes. On the other hand, it helps you to protect your brand. And how does it that? It, it's done or it's realized with integrated compliance checks. And on the other hand, it also supports you to reduce your compliance risk and your costs with automated compliance checks. So that's three of the main benefits of a software solution. And I would like now to sum up my session. What did you learn today? So the session is, or one of my key aspects was, what is the correlation in between of product compliance and human rights due diligence acts? And as you learned, it's the material compliance. It's the UN conventions like Minamata or also Stockholm. The other thing I would want to explain to you was how a five-step approach could look like. And as you learned, you can start with the organizational implementation and with the complier customer compliance. But the main focus of product compliance will be the compliance of your purchase parts, the product compliance of the purchase parts and the product compliance of the self-manufactured parts. And last but not least, I explained to you with the last four slides how software could support you with fulfilling these obligations. And in, with the SAP software, you need the feature packages which are called Compliance Requirement Management and Compliance Disclosure Management. So that's the end of my session. I hope I could bring you all the facts about my three key questions, key aspects, and I hope you were happy with that session and good luck with the learning questions. Thanks and see you soon.